is JS Party, your weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Check us out on the web at jsparty.fm. There you'll find lists of our recommended and popular episodes, clips, and a request form so you can let us know what you want to hear about on the pod. Big thanks to our partners at Fly.io. Over 3 million apps have launched on Fly. Learn how at Fly.io. Okay, hey, it's party time, y'all. What's up, party people? I want to see about a new sponsor of ours, Jam.dev. Yes, Jam.dev is one-click bug reports that devs love. It's just too easy. Get Jam for free today at Jam.dev. And today I'm here with Danny Grant, the CEO and co-founder of Jam. So Danny, how do you describe Jam? If you've ever reported a bug, you've probably had this happen to you. You see the bug, you write all the information into a ticket, engineer opens the ticket, writes, works fine on my end, closes the ticket. That's because those of us like me who create tickets never put the information that engineers actually need because we don't know. And the words that we use in English to describe an issue are never specific enough for an engineer. Like if I write that login didn't work, didn't work could mean so many different things. So Jam eliminates all of this miscommunication. It's a tool that lets someone like me, a product manager or a QA person or someone in support, one click to grab what's on the screen, plus everything in DevTools, console logs, network requests, the timing waterfall, session metadata, everything, and package it into one link in the ticket so an engineer never has to ask a follow-up question. So I've reported many bugs before as a PM, as an owner, as a whatever, and that sounds like it saves a ton of time. This saves afternoons of debugging. You no longer have to jump on a call and share screen to debug. You no longer have to show a PM how to find the console and look for logs. Engineers say it saves them at least an hour per issue, and it's mostly just that back and forth they no longer have to do. But what I hear from product managers who use Jam is they used to, after reporting a ticket, get a bunch of follow-up questions from engineers, and now they create a ticket and they never hear about it again. Okay, friends, go to jam.dev and learn more about what Jam is doing for teams to make bug reporting and all that fun stuff super easy, super fast. Get Jam for free today, jam.dev. Again, jam.dev. of Node and more recently, but not that recently, it turns out, Dino. What's up, Ryan? Hey, how's it going? It's going well. Thanks for joining me. You know, I was just on YouTube checking out some of the Node documentaries. I think Honeypot put up a new one that's a little bit shorter about the origins of Dino. And I was looking like 600,000 people watched the Node.js documentary. I think the, the new one has thousands as well. And I wondered, Did you ever think this would happen to you, like just for slinging some C++ code and putting your ideas out there? Like you're kind of a internet celebrity now. Day after day, it continually surprises me. It's just, (laughs) you know, like every year, like this is how big Node will be, right? And then, you know, the next year it gets bigger and bigger. Uh, It's it's, uh, a privilege to (laughs) have worked on on this. Well, well well-deserved. And of course, not just yourself, hundreds, scores of people uh, working on Node over the years. And of course, Dino, you are uh, primary on Dino, but a team over there as well. And gosh, I said not too recently because you've been working on Dino a long time now. Hasn't it been like six or seven years? Yeah, it's been a, been a while. Uh, I think we started this in 2019 and just kind of a Kind of got got off to a slow start demo for for a pro, for a conference, uh, but uh, right, yeah, it's we've been plugging away at it. Yeah, and we are on the edge of Dino two now, so you're gonna have an official two point launch pending uh, coming very very soon. It's in a release candidate, so I'm sure people can get out there and use it right now today, right? Yeah, it's basically feature. Yeah, the release candidate is is almost exactly what what will be there. Uh, yeah, we released Dino one back in. 2020. So it's it's been four years now. We've talked a lot about, we thought about this for a while about how uh-huh. what to do for, for Dino 2. 
and uh, teased it multiple times, but but always kind of pulled back from it because we're like, yeah, actually, no, it's it's missing this. We're we're not sure. Like we have to. So we've we've thought long and hard about this this release, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited to finally get it out there. The cool thing about Dino and its origin was these ten mistakes I made with Node and that conference talk, like you mentioned, and then this was your second effort to rearrange the letters, start fresh, fix some of those mistakes. But you've been working on Dino now for seven years, and so I'm not saying there should be a third effort. But like, are there things you've learned about Dino, or do you have Dino regrets at this point? It's been long enough. Everybody has regrets, right? Sure. I mean, we're, there are things that I said in that original talk that Dino 2 actually goes back on. So for for example, like <laughs> oh, really? introducing the process global variable is, is I think, uh, you know, one, one of the, the things I regretted about Node. Uh-huh. Turns out, like, yeah, I, I think the we're just kind of hit, hitting reality with, with you know, how, how big the NPM ecosystem is and yeah. just realizing that, and this is, this is kind of a, a big part of, of Dino too, is, is just realizing, you know, if you're going to, if you want to be able to pull in some random NPM library like gRPC, which you definitely want to be able to do because it's super complicated right. and like you're not going to rewrite that you have to be pretty close. You have to, you know, basically implement the node built in APIs. And uh, although we look at this very carefully and still have a core philosophy of leveling up JavaScript and narrowing the gap between server side JavaScript and browser JavaScript and looking to the future of JavaScript, Dino is not a re-implementation of node in rust uh Mm -hmm. there is uh you know work that has been done to to be able to import npm packages and be able to run node projects out of the box and yeah at at this point with with dino 2 like it's pretty great like you can basically drop into uh most node projects let's say modern node projects if they're using esm Mm -hmm. uh, not if they're using common js and uh, use use dino with them so you initially started with a clean cut from NPM as well with your own URL based imports. And you since had, I mean, you basically had to do that stuff because there's so much, like you said, there's extant code out there. There's packages that you just don't want to have to re implement on the Dino side because let's be realistic. I mean, when Node came out, I remember that first call to for contributors that you gave and it was like, come create things for Node.js because it was available for use, but there were no, there was no standard library. There was no code there to use, and people did. It was amazing. I mean, there was like the frontier of web development. Uh, server side was make a node package for this. I mean, the person who made the gRPC package initially, of course, that was probably years later. I'm not sure when gRPC became interesting to folks, but that person, it was Greenfield, and they were probably highly motivated to do that. But nowadays, it's like, well, I already have Node. I have a gRPC over here in npm it's now a barrier to Dino, right? It's no longer Greenfield. It's like, would I, do I want to rewrite this or port it over? And so when did you guys make that call? And was that a tough one to finally, it's a pragmatic choice. Like you have to kind of ditch a little bit of the pure, the pure idealism of, of the start of the fresh start. Right. Yeah. Uh, a very, very difficult, uh, decision to be made after, <laughs> after <Yeah>. like <laughs> wringing <laughs> our hands over, over long periods of time. Yeah. I mean, the, the original idea with the Dino module system is, uh, let's follow the ESM spec. Exactly. Let's follow exactly what browsers do. And, uh, browsers allow you to have, uh, HTTPS imp- imports in there and, uh, local imports. And can we actually like build an entire module system on top of that? The answer is yes, you can, and it works pretty nice. Like it's pretty great, especially for like single file scripts and kind of small little programs. You can you can just kind of drop in some imports in there and and uh, get off to the races pretty quickly. It gets problematic as you kind of scale up in complexity, and in particular when you need to interoperate with different systems, right? When you need to pull in the AWS uh, SDK, right? Like you're there's just some things that you are not going to rewrite and. Uh, you know, I think we've we found a middle ground here with like NPM specifiers where, you know, we're still staying true to the ESM spec. These are still URLs, uh, URIs uh, in, in that like it's NPM colon express. Um, 
yet, uh, you know, in order to pull in NPM packages, it's much more complicated than the HTTP specifiers. I mean, the beauty of, of the original Dino vision was like, oh, this dead simple resolution scheme that like really makes it easy to interoperate with. If, if people implemented this, may, makes it very easy to interoperate with stuff. And uh, yeah, frankly, the reality is like that works to some scale, but you know, we're, we're interested in making software for lots of people. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm not satisfied working on a runtime that, you know, 500 people can use for small scripts. I, right. I, I really want to make software for millions of people. And uh, server side JavaScript is, is truly millions of people. And in order to allow those people to, to really level up JavaScript, uh, you, you, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that you need to be able to, to pull in NPM modules and understand package JSON and uh, implement the node built in modules in order to make any progress. Otherwise, you just re- face this uh, boil the ocean problem. Yeah, exactly. And you can't, and you have to meet people where they are, you know, for them to actually benefit because you're trying to make software that's A, used by the mass developers and B has to then be useful to all of them or many of them. Uh, you're not happy, like you said, writing a niche runtime that 500 people use back in the day, go back seven years. I know you had this initial idea and it was like, I, I think in that, in that initial speech, you said that node kind of offended some of your sensibilities over time. And I know there's a lot of personal history there and there's, you know, job related stuff and lots of baggage there, just mental baggage. I'm sure it was just more fun to start fresh with something else. But now that you're like competing with your previous creation in terms of getting people to use Dino, and that's probably an uphill battle because node is established and it's like the de facto and it's probably hard to move certain people. Is there an alternate world where instead of starting fresh that you just said, like, I'm either going to fork node and start from there and change these things, or I'm going to rejoin the node technical steering committee and like, I don't know if that could have even happened, but like moved it in a direction because then you wouldn't have to regain all these users. You'd have all the millions of users already. I'm sure that's possible, but I... I'm still pretty adamant that like this this new base infrastructure that we've built for for Dino, uh, the the Rust code base that we have, the secure by default capabilities, the native TypeScript support, the fact that we have all these built these web standard APIs, uh, the fact that it's a uh, all in one tool chain, right? It's it's literally a single executable that you know has a LSP, has has uh, code formatting, has linting. I'm not willing to sit in committees for for uh, you know 13 years trying to make all of all of that stuff happen. You know, I think the failure mode of Dino might be that it ultimately ends up being an R and D effort because you know Node these days like looks at what we do and and says, oh, okay, actually those that's a good idea. Let's let's kind of pull pull this in like like the native TypeScript support. Mm-hmm. But I, I I am bullish on on what we're doing. I, I think it is very useful to have Dino.exe that you can hand to not just uh, deep JavaScript developers that know what prettier is and know you know know how to configure how to get started with the project, but can hand it to some random Java developer or you know somebody coming from PHP or or whatever yeah. and just allow them to get started very easily. And I think this, this idea of striving for simplicity is, uh, well, let's put it this way. JavaScript, I continue to believe is not like other programming languages. It is something like the default programming language because so much of human infrastructure is built on the web. And because JavaScript is like HTTP or CSS or HTML, it like it is one of the protocols of the web. Mm-hmm. Like it has a future that you can't necessarily say about Swift. You know, lots of people use Swift. A lot of infrastructure is built on Swift, but sure. it's not like JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript will be here five years from now, if not ten, if not twenty, if not, you know, forever. It might. It, this may be like like really deeply embedded in human in humanity at this point. And mm-hmm. uh, I think it's I, I think it is worth the effort to try to strive and make this simple and you know allow server side JavaScript, which obviously is is useful, to have the fetch API to <laughs> to sure. you know use use the same APIs that are in the browser to use ES modules, right? Like there there 
I think this is kind of uh, slowly coming around uh, that like people are accepting that ES modules is is actually the standard. But I mean, gosh, uh, <laughs> like how, how long how long is it going to take? Right. Uh, when you run a, a file in Node these days, it is still not defaulting to ESM. It's 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 common JS. So good point. I mean, I think the autonomy and the ability to move quickly and not have to convince others of your ideas is to me highly desirable in any software project. So I 100% understand why you went that way. And your take on JavaScript is on point. There's been two recent rankings released, one from IEEE Spectrum, which had J JS I think it was one or two, maybe Python was one, JavaScript was two, in terms of sur surveyed from their readership. and But then TypeScript was like five or six. So if you combine those two, which I mean, come on, you might as well just combine those two, uh, a clear number one. And so there's academia right there. And then you go to industry. Red Monk recently did their rankings this year, top 20 languages in use in industry, according to their tech, you know, their methodologies. I'm not sure what the methodologies are, but you got JavaScript at number one, and then TypeScript is down there at five or six. And so imagine how number one, number one gets if you just combine those two. Or, I mean, GitHub, top languages on GitHub as of the 2023 survey, which um, I'm familiar with because I, I tweeted something about it, is uh, uh, JavaScript number one, TypeScript is number three, and Python's number yeah. two. So it's like, yeah, no, it's massive. It is it is it really absolutely, is. I like, and, and you know, just, just as a programmer, you know, like if you're going to give it is the default programming language right is is kind mm. of the shared the shared knowledge that all programmers have so going back to dino as different from node from this project uh, we'll definitely get to dino too so bear with me but here's a thought that i had dino is different in so far as it's a startup right this is a business and that's different and new that constraint informs a lot of decisions i'm sure how has that constraint helped dino as a project over the 7 years of its inception I mean, it's worth pointing out, first of all, that Dino is MIT licensed, so it is essentially public domain software. It's completely free, right? Uh, it's not a commercial product. Our, our commercial product is in kind of cloud hosting services. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, when I was working on Node, there was a time where it was very clear that Node was taking off, and I could not hire any people to work on this. Uh, and that was re a ridiculous situation uh, because... The company I worked for saw this as some sort of marketing effort when in fact, like this was the most important thing that that company was <laughs> undertaking or, you know, back in, in 2010, we didn't have the same kind of funding situation that, that we do in, in these days. And, you know, I, I, building software like Node or Dino is a expensive undertaking, right? Software engineers mm -hmm. are expensive. Uh, it requires a lot of time and energy to work on stuff. And it's good to have clear direction and not just a herding cats, right? You, have, you move very slowly when, <laughs> when like you rely on external contributions and it goes in different directions. And uh, yeah, I, I want to, you know, I, I, I have certain software that I want to build and, and I want to push it in, in a certain direction. And this is software for the masses too, that, that is not so far away from all sorts of business concerns. So I think it's totally reasonable to have a company around this. And I, I think it's, it's kind of the right incentive structure as well for, for building open source software. You know, there, there's this two sides of, of the same coin. Like there's open source developers out there that will complain about, you know, how they have to work for free and they have to deal with issues and random people like writing in. And then there's other people out there complaining about VC funded uh, open source projects that, <laughs> that mm -hmm. like, you know, oh God, like what, what, what's kind of the motivation behind this? Are they going to, uh, you know, do something sneaky here? I, you know, I think these are the same problem. Like we, we need to get paid to write software. We're writing, we're building open source uh, public domain software. MIT license is very, very free, right? Like people can mm -hmm. fork it, they can sell it, they can do anything with it. We are, I think the important thing is, is to be honest and, and not change licenses under, out from under people. I think that's, that, is, that is unacceptable. But uh, mm -hmm. beyond that, like being able to build some software, release it for free, and then you know, use that software in other situations for commercial purposes, like perfectly aligns the incentives. And, and you know, uh, I am fortunate enough to be in a position where, where we were able to raise money to work on this. Is that no relicense thing 
is that formalized in any way? I mean, I feel like there should be some sort of like no rug pull clause somewhere or somehow in a way that you can't just say, well, I, Ryan Dahl, say that it's never going to happen. You're like, sure, that's great. But then what happens if somebody else runs the company or you get, I mean, I'm sure there's a board of directors, maybe you get X, excised as the CEO and the next guy comes in and says, well, we're relicensing to fair source or something else. Well, it is, it is MIT licensed. So you can go start a company and you can fork Dino and then you can release it under, you know, you can sure. make a, you know, hire a bunch of engineers and, and uh, work on it for two years and then license those changes under something else. Right. And it's, you know, it could be that, that, you know, Dino goes in a different direction and, and the, you know, Dino four or whatever gets, gets uh, like relicensed. What we've built so far uh, uh, is MIT licensed and and will be that that way. Sure. And no, there's no legal system in which this is dictated, other than my own integrity, right? And and saying that this is what that what we're doing as a company. So yeah, I mean, well, you haven't pulled the mask off and said muahaha in the, in the last seven years. So I expect you know more of the same in terms of ah, I'm now relicensing and everything I do in the future is going to. Uh, go against everything I've said in the past. It's just there's there's good intentions, and then we have over time change in organizational structures. It seems that usually changes what ultimately leads to uh, a relicensing in the future. So I'm always curious if people have thought about how to somehow just formalize their intentions. Maybe even if just saying out loud is is sometimes all you can do. Well, I, I think it comes down to the business model. So you mm -hmm. get into trouble with open core business models because you have to decide, are these features commercial features or are these free features? And that, that kind of uh, aligns the incentives in a, in a poor way where you're, you're basically, you know, stealing from the open source users to, to uh, or not stealing, of course, the, yeah, these yeah. people are developing it. But, you know, the, the incentives are just kind of the, the commercial is pitted against the open source. And what I'm trying to do, I, I re have long recognized this, uh, you know, I, I want my business model to be orthogonal to the open source project. So it helps mm. it, uh, you know, we're developing a JavaScript infrastructure that can be used in, in many places. We don't sell a, you know, enterprise version of Dino with like special enterprise features. We sell hosting services, right? We, we, we sell things that are, are orthogonal to Dino itself. Yeah. I do think that's the best model so far for the style of software that you're building. Of course, different types of open source, I think, lend themselves to different models. We're, we're all we're all figuring it out. But, you know, I, I think it's it's really um, misplaced to, you know, look at somebody who is uh, or anybody who, who is like putting out public free public domain stuff and, and say you are doing something wrong. Like, I mean that that's somebody else's time and energy that's that's being put into um, essentially free software, right? That that uh, yeah. you know w whatever happens with it in the future. I mean, you know, at least that software is is free and and benefits humanity in in some way. But yeah, I, I you know I I think a lot about this stuff, and I I, I really want to uh, set up Dino as a company to not be in a position where uh, yeah it, it needs to be uh, relicensed. Uh, in the event that like I am somehow not part of the company, that's uh, sure. an inconceivable proposition uh, right now, but you know, who knows? Well, you know, the old saying, no good deed goes unpunished and it's doubly true on the internet. I mean, you are going to be criticized if you go left and you're going to be criticized if you go right. Yeah. And that's just kind of how it works. Yep. All right. Let's talk Dino two. You said you guys kind of agonized over when you could call it a two. This is always a hard problem even for the folks who are trying to sember their projects, which is usually libraries, not so much runtimes, but hard problem. What's a, what's a major, what's a minor? Is this a patch? Of course, most majors in these cases are for uh, marketing purposes, which I think is totally fine. You got to get attention on what you've been up to and you can't just simply release things all the time and people just don't pay attention. So usually a 2.0 comes with it, a whole bunch of stuff. This one certainly does. You want to iterate over a few of the high points and we'll talk about them. Yeah, so uh, it, Dino does follow Semver, and and there are breaking changes in this. But uh, Dino two is is really trying to uh, 
you know, I, I guess calling it marketing in, in, in some sense, it just just trying to, to give some weight to the changes that, that are coming in Dino. So a lot of it's backwards compatible. There are some minor breaking changes, but those are, you know, essentially just small API things that aren't, aren't super important. The big changes are the module system. The mm-hmm. fact that the NPM, uh, the ability to pull in NPM modules is like really good now. The fact that we support package JSON projects. So if you have like a mm-hmm. package JSON with some scripts in it and some dependencies, like you can actually run those right out, right in Dino. And the introduction of JSR, which is uh, kind of this newfangled uh, competitor to, to NPM. No, not, not a competitor in, in a way. It's, it's a superset <laughs> to NPM. Okay. Uh, it's a new package registry where you can share JavaScript and TypeScript code. And yeah, uh, we are introducing some stability guarantees. Uh, probably most people listening here don't don't care about that, but uh, yeah, we're 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 starting a, an LTS, a long term support release, uh, giving some better stability guarantees on not changing APIs in the future. Not that we were changing them very often, but you know, having a branch that we backport security fixes to. So yeah, this this all kind of. Uh, comes together and uh yeah we we want to let people know that that like things are things are pretty different than you know the dino one days where you uh can only import hgp specifiers which by the way you can still do in dino but it's not necessarily the recommended path for distributing code we recommend you publish to npm pull in packages there or publish to jsr which is uh the delightful alternative to that if you don't can't figure out how to uh, compile your TypeScript to JavaScript and whether you should support ESM or CommonJS or or some other thing. And if you want to be supporting multiple runtimes, because JSR is is not just uh, for Node, it is for Dino, Node, Bun, Cloudflare workers, et cetera, browsers. Very cool. JSR is very interesting because the history of NPM is fraught with costs. It was a cost center, effectively. It was infrastructure for all of us web developers. And NPM Inc., or whatever, I think that's what it is, NPM Inc., became the entity that had to bear the burden of that cost of just hosting millions and millions and maybe trillions of downloads over the years. And so JSR, I assume, also must cost some money to run. How are you guys doing that? How's it working? Uh, I mean, we just pay for it right now, the, the Dino company. It's designed to be simply hosted. Uh, it's it's designed to be cost effective. It's designed to be very cacheable and, and simple. Mm. You know, JSR is not is not a commercial project. It is also MIT licensed. It, 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 uh, I have no intention of, of ever turning this into a business. We, you know, the Dino company is, is running this right now, but um, I'm, I'm hoping to get this into a foundation and... Uh, you know, generally having this be a public service for for JavaScript because NPM is just not not evolving ever. Like it's it's just not changing post GitHub ac- ac- no, it's acquisition, not. and this is just really strange for the world's most popular programming language. Like, are are we really just going to stand by and let this be a static future for forever? Like. How difficult is it to publish a, a JavaScript package these days? Like you just you have to have a lot of knowledge, and that's in a language where things are just supposed to be trivially trivially easy, right? Like <laughs> if, if I want something that's really hard, like let me go to the Rust ecosystem, and at least I'll I'll get like a lot of speed out of it. Um, <laughs> like yeah, exactly. Yeah, JavaScript should be simple. It should be. This is a scripting language. It's for the children, right? It's it, it should just be super super easy to do stuff. And because of this module, you know, because of the common JS ESM situation, because NPM is not changing, because Node it changes very, very slowly, and you know, us us old timers in the, in the JavaScript world, uh, you know, maybe look past this because we're so familiar with with all of the troubles uh, that they don't even seem like you know we don't even see them as troubles anymore. Uh, you, you realize that, like, actually, you know, writing a, a library in TypeScript and figuring out how to po- post it to to NPM in a way that, like, lots of people can consume it is not actually super trivial. Like, definitely does not tell you how to do that on the NPM website. And, uh, yeah, in, in JSR, this is super trivial. You just write your TypeScript, you, you post it directly, and suddenly you can use it in Node. You can use it anywhere. Like, it's... it's uh, it is uh, delightfully trivial. 
is it the kind of thing where you would write a package and you would maybe put it on both registries for in the meantime, or does it matter? Like if I was going to author something, maybe I'd already know how to do all the crazy NPM things you have to do. Is it, I just post them both. Do I post a JSR? How do, how do you suggest? So there, there are quite a few people posting them to both just because JSR is new and, uh, you know, people are kind of uncertain about it. But, uh, you know, I, I think that that will dissipate with time. JSR actually has an NPM registry built into it. So npm.jsr.io is, is the NPM registry. And when you publish there, it builds an NPM package and speaks the NPM protocol. And so you can you can actually import JSR NPM packages like in the NPM format uh, <laughs> directly okay. in Node, for example, just by setting some stuff in your NPM RC file. So there is a little bit of, uh, you know, like a one line sort of setup to be able to pull in JSR packages that in, in a node project directly from, from mm -hmm. JSR. But uh, yeah, nevertheless, people, people are also often posting things to, to NPM. And it's, it's a feature that we're kind of dwelling on right now about whether we should support it. It'd be pretty easy to, to like, allow people to post to JSR and then auto post to NPM just to just to kind of have uh, uh, an NPM first uh, experience. Um, you know, if yeah. that helps people, I think that's that might be worthwhile doing. But yeah, generally, you know, the the, the broad strokes of, of everything I'm undertaking here is like, let's level up JavaScript. Let's just make this nicer. Let's strive to make this nicer. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, if, if you use if you use JSR either as a consumer or a publisher, you will be delighted. Like, uh, you know, auto-generated documentation. Like, why does JavaScript not have auto-generated documentation? Like, you know, with, with everybody writing stuff in TypeScript these days, like we have all the information available and yet, uh, you know, somehow NPM does not have this feature. Like we, we, we need to, to make some progress here. And clearly Microsoft is, is not doing that. Microsoft slash GitHub, I should say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. No, I agree with that. So as an author, I totally understand why JSR would be cool, especially if I'm an author of a package and I don't have all of the NPM know-how. As a end user who just has a package JSON in my in my Dino app or something like, why does JSR help me, or does it matter if I'm npm installing JSR? Yeah, I mean, auto generated docs, for example, is is something that's that's going to help you. Uh, we have something called the JSR score, which is uh, stolen from from Dart, actually, okay. uh, where we kind of rank packages. We, we give you a better score if you follow best practices. So, you know, we don't force you to, to do all this rigmarole up front because, you know, sometimes you just want to publish something and don't, don't want to do too much. But uh, you, you kind of get this signal about like how, what, what sort of best practices are, are people following? Like, are they, are they adding doc strings to all of their exported modules? Are, are they, do they have a readme? Do they have a license file? This, this sort of thing. You know, it's, it's generally much more searchable. You can search through symbols. You can, uh, it uh, allows you to pull in TypeScript types nicely. If those packages are, are written in TypeScript, there's not like a definitively typed thing that you also need to know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's generally a good experience. But I, I, yeah, I would say the, the real 10x behavior is, is when you publish that. And then it's like, oh my God, I can't, can't believe it's so simple. Or I, you know, rather, I can't believe, now I recognize how terrible uh, NPM publishing actually is. That's awesome. And JSR modules don't lock you into Dino. Like you can use it in Node, you can use it in other things, right? That's right. Yeah, you can you can mark in your package which runtimes are supported, and that displays it on the package page. And so there are modules posted to JSR that that have nothing to do with Dino, right? Uh, browser only, or or for Bun, for example, it is not Dino specific. That's awesome. So I'm here looking at a Node server file I have on my machine that has import fastify import puppeteer and import aws sdk at this point with dino 2 i could just dino run this sucker you think 
I'm going to say yes. Uh, it's it's always a little little bit of an open question about whether <laughs> little hesitation, but probably a right. Little hesitation uh, because, uh, gosh, there are a lot of built-in Node APIs, and they have a lot of funky behavior that uh, is is really difficult to. <laughs> there, there's an endless list of compatibility bugs, and there's always going to be like a long tail of of, uh, of compatibility, but. AWS, Puppeteer, and Fastify, I think we support all of those. So I think it should work. That's really exciting. Uh oh. Are you going to try it live? Is it- <laughs> I was thinking about trying it. Well, I don't have Dino 2 on this machine. I still have Dino 1. Can I just, uh, I probably can't brew install. You can do Dino upgrade, and then Dino upgrade RC will get you the, the release candidate for, for Dino 2. This Dino was built without the upgrade feature. Please upgrade that, probably because I brew install. Oh, you, it. You, have, you have homebrew. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you'd have to install from our curl script, and then you can uh, All right. you can do it. I will uh, post later whether or not it works. Okay. I will not uh, take this long of a, a diversion, well, my, unless you're super interested in it. My, my hands are, are sweaty, but uh, yeah. Uh, okay, let's try it. How do I install uh, via your just dino.land and follow the... Dino.com can uh, grab that curl script, run it. There it is. Now, if I already have it installed via brew, are we going to have any issues or is it going to be all good? You might have to add something to your path, but it uh, should, should, be, should be okay. All right. So I just got Dino version 1.46.3. So now I run Dino upgrade. Dino space upgrade space RC. All right. So Dino run server. Uh, you, you can just do Dino task. Maybe you have some scripts in there in your package JSON. Yeah, I just have just a start script. This is a pretty simple thing besides the fact that it has Puppeteer, which immediately makes it not simple. Task start node server.js. Well, it's running. So my I guess my task says node. So is it running node now? I think it might might actually switch that out with Dino. I'm, I'm, uh, well, that would can be... Can you do like PS and see if you have yes. node processes or Dino processes? Yes. PS tree maybe uh, to, to kind of see the sub-process of the... The Dino task process. I see the task, Dino task start. I don't see any sub processes. In PS tree? I don't have a PS tree command. Is that an argument to PS? Is PS tree? No, no, that's that's a special command. You might have to brew install that. Brew install. Um, or, I mean, you can just do it in, in PS, but you might have other node processes running. I just have the one. I just have Dino task start. That's literally. And that's the only Dino process? Oh no, auto update and homebrew. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Hold on. Let me go this direction. Oh, I got a bunch of Node tasks running. Apparently, Adobe Creative Cloud is running Node. Maybe it just happened to be a match. This is getting nasty. Uh, Let's try it this way. Can I do uh, Dino run server.js? Is Dino run a thing? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, let's just try that because then we're guaranteed to use Dino, right? You might have to give it a dash A or dash 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 allow net or something to to uh, right. Should I allow? I'm going to say allow all because I'm living dangerously. I'm allowing sys. I'm allowing read. I'm allowing write. I'm allowing run. I'm allowing net. Yeah. Hey, it is serving on port three thousand. It works. Congrats. <laughs> for me, that was relatively simple. I'm sure for you and your team, that was a huge lift. Super, super huge lift. Yeah. Yeah. D- Dino does implement a huge number of the Node APIs at this point. And uh, yeah, it, it was a very large lift. Uh, and, and, you know, also given from, you know, the principles in which Dino started, also kind of a philosophical lift as well. But uh, yeah, we're we're here. You know, we, we've we've convinced ourselves this is this is what we need to do in order to level up JavaScript. This is how we can make people's lives simpler, uh, and that this this ultimately is is kind of a better experience for everybody. Even if this means you know deep inside of Dino, we do implement Common JS somewhere. Like we we do we have to do that <laughs> in order to interoperate with with uh, npm modules, and you know it it gets complicated deep deep inside. But uh, hopefully for the user, it's a single executable that just does all of this stuff that, uh, you know, hopefully is pretty understandable. You know, it has a Dino LSP that like if you open up VS Code, we'll, we'll interact with that and you know, nice. give you linting and, and uh, code formatting and, and all sorts of type checking, obviously. That's exciting. I mean, 
as a fellow idealist slash purist, like part of me dies as you talk about this, but part of me actually is also excited because I'm way more likely to use this. I think a lot of people are way more likely to use this. Has Have people responded? I know Dino 2 is just getting out there, but some of this NPM support has been there for a, for a while now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, am, I am an idealist and it, it was hard to me, for me to kind of come to terms with this. But like, yeah, like, like I said, I mean, we're, we're building software for people. Uh, yeah. And, and if, if people can't run it, then we're not achieving our, our goal of, of leveling up JavaScript. I think what uh, excites me, though, is that we've actually built this, you know, in a pretty structured way. This is not just a a monolithic app, but there's actually multiple layers. That, so you're using the Dino executable. That's kind of the mm-hmm. highest layer, you know, what, what most people will interact with. But there's also different Rust libraries, uh, lots of different Rust libraries, actually, that you can kind of plug into at different layers, depending on like which experience you want. Uh, so people can actually build custom runtimes pretty easily with with Rust with V8 using the lowest layer would be Rusty V8, which is is our basically like zero overhead Rust uh, bindings to V8, and V8's APIs are wildly complicated. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. uh, it is it is not <laughs> an, an easy beast to drive, but you know in Rust you can do this all in a in a, a memory safe way, it's it's like very nice to you. Like the C plus plus API, like you need to know what you're doing like pretty seriously in order to drive it. Mm. In in Rust, like you can kind of just hammer on the keyboard and write a a V8 runtime. Uh, uh, just just because like whatever when it compiles, it's 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 kind of going to work. Uh, yeah, Rusty V8 is is uh, also going 1.0 uh, next week actually. And uh, above that is Dino Core, which is adds a little bit more infrastructure, adds the module system, adds not the NPM stuff, but but adds kind of basic uh, ESM modules, uh, adds a thing called Ops, which is basically our binding layer to Rust, an easy way to like make async functions kind of bind into JavaScript, uh, you know, essentially do this um, in a super optimal way. Mm-hmm. Above that, we have EXTs, which are like different think of them as like native modules. So for example, one EXT, uh, one extension set of modules is like the fetch API. Uh, And so maybe you just want Dino core plus the fetch API and nothing else. Then you can build your own runtime using those two things. Obviously all this stuff is MIT licensed. And so, you know, for different use cases, you know, obviously you need to be programming in Rust. Like this isn't necessarily approachable to, to everybody. But, you know, for some systems, like uh, maybe you're, you're building a, uh, a serverless system where you really only want fetch and you just want uh, uh, some JavaScript execution while well, you can kind of plug into it at, at this lower layer. So, uh, yeah, the D- high level Dino executable is, is opinionated, uh, has a bunch of functionality in it. But, you know, we still have these, these lower layer things. And I think that's kind of the appropriate um, trade off, right? Because, uh, mm-hmm. you know, there's a smaller audience at those lower layers, but they're also more technical. They, they're also able to, to kind of deal with this stuff. The, the highest level people just want to pull in the AWS SDK and they don't care right. at all about anything else. They're like, <laughs> do you have that? Yes or no? Uh, end, of, end of story. Right. And, and like, yeah, we in Dino, we just need to pull that in. That's really cool that you've been able to architect it in such a way that is extensible like that and allows people, I mean, talk about, again, meeting people where they are. There are people that appreciate those lower levels and they can, you know, they can use that, those open source projects to their own benefit. And that's really cool and allows you to continue to take pride in it and to, you know, usher things forward while still, you know, supporting the things that you have to support in order to bring people along with you. You mentioned serverless computing. I think last time you were on the show, which I guess was two years ago now, we were talking about winter CG and some of the efforts between you all and Cloudflare to kind of formalize a spec around serverless runtimes. I haven't really kept up with that. Is that something that's continued to move forward? Is there progress there? Is it bearing fruit, this effort to create these specs? I, I mean, it is still a thing. Um, I, I think, you know, people might imagine that it's more more than it is i mean it's it's really kind of describing in in minute detail uh kind of how say fetch works in in server environments uh Mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to get agreement between all of the the server side uh vendors and uh, on like what what kind of constitutes uh servers in in javascript um 
that uh, is is a goal, but but you know is is probably not uh, in something immediate. There's not going to be a spec for uh, exactly how how you know an HEP server is going to work in in, uh, in JavaScript. But uh, nevertheless, we we participate in it. Uh, yeah, fair enough. As you talked about these different layers. One of the more interesting features I think you have added, which for me as a person who's been in the open source world for a long time and cares about sustainability and talks about licenses, you know, real kind of wonky in these areas, Dino KV was very interesting to me because it's kind of like where, A, it's open source, uh, this is a key value store built right into Dino and has a potential, I guess, upgrade path to Dino the service, you know, Dino the hosted stuff. Um, where that database can be hosted by you all for pay. But then also you don't have to do that. And this is like one of those areas, again, where I wouldn't call this, this is not open core. I don't think so. It's a hosted service. But it's like that weird connection point of like, well, where does the runtime stop and the product begin? And I'm just curious your thoughts through that, because I'm sure you thought deeply about it as you guys designed it. Yeah, so just for for clarity, like in in the Dino open source project, uh, the Dino KB APIs are backed by SQLite, and you can kind of run a single instance and and kind of have that same functionality. In Dino Deploy, our our commercial platform, uh, when you you run, you know, these edge functions that are running across the world, uh, the the Dino KB APIs are backed by Foundation DB. And it's like kind of this this big distributed database that's pretty sweet. The Dino KB APIs are not stabilized in Dino two. Uh, we we they continue okay. to be experimental in part because this is kind of an experimental business effort, and and we're not quite sure if if we want to go further down this route. I actually want to decouple the KB APIs from the Dino runtime itself and have them be a module mm. that you pull in, you know, you should be, be able to pull in uh, JSR, you know, at Dino slash KV and, and just have, have like, there's no, per, no real reason that it needs to be built directly into the runtime. That's just, uh, yeah, for ease of implementation, essentially. Sure. So I, you know, I think the open core concerns or, or uh, incentive concerns are, are, would be addressed by, by kind of decoupling them. Uh, it also yeah. makes in- the engineering effort a bit easier, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting you say that because that was my initial reaction when it first came out. I think we talked about it on the show. And I was like, it's cool. It's interesting. It seems experimental. Would I use it? I don't know. It seems kind of strange that it's like a top level global inside of the runtime. Like, why is this not just a package? Um, it makes sense. You're saying, you know, technically it's probably easier for you guys, especially when you're experimenting with a new feature, just like, well, we're just going to drop it in right here. Cause that's the easy ist button, maybe not an easy button, but the easiest button and see how it works out. So, I mean, that's, that's fascinating that you've kind of thought, well, maybe it makes more sense just as a package versus a, a built-in thing. Yeah, yeah, and and it is it is not safe. Yeah, just to clarify, it is not stabilized in in Dino two, so it's not something that we are necessarily supporting indefinitely. I, I got gotcha. it, it, it likely will be moved, but you know, nevertheless, the Dino KV stuff is pretty awesome to you. I don't know if you played around with it at all, but uh, I have no. <laughs> like our other stuff. It's it's just freaking delightful to to have like a, a easy state store but yeah there's there's a lot of questions to uh think yeah. through with with that because yeah obviously a lot of people need a bit more of a complex database than a kv store um and like real application code actually needs a relational database and what's interesting is that node recently added the experimental sqlite support and i thought was that maybe again you being their research arm maybe they're like wow putting a key value store in there we could just drop SQLite in there and you'd give, you know, more, more power than a key value store. But, uh, I don't know, you know, if there's, if they were inspired by you or if it's simul- not simultaneous invention, but yeah, I think, I, I think there's a lot of ideas around here, uh, probably more inspired by bun that, that did that. Oh, does bun have a direct SQLite embedded thing? Yeah. Gotcha. I think it's a little, yeah. Uh, there is, a little bit questionable because I mean you can always pull this stuff into packages and there's there's always sure. the question of like where's where's the runtime concern and, and what what belongs outside of it and it's always a difficult discussion it's it's hard to have kind of a, a an algorithm for for deciding that but uh, you know if if Node does stabilize that API because Dino does implement the Node built in APIs we we will implement right. that and of course we have <laughs> SQLite we already use SQLite in there so it'd be a pretty trivial matter to to add that. Yeah, that's cool. So much, 
I love the competition and the spirit of innovation and like the fact that all these ideas are going back and forth and different directions. I think the whole community really benefits uh, when these things happen. That's what's exciting about JavaScript, right? It's, it's just like, Seriously. it's, uh, it's, it's madness. Uh, it's chaos. Uh, but, but it's, it's just kind of, uh, yeah, there's, there's so many people with different ideas and, and everybody's um, inventing new things all the time. I, yeah. I think it's, it's really fun. 100%. Do you guys have any other experiments in the works? Anything you're working on that you're excited about testing out, whether it's, you know, monetization or otherwise, like cool new stuff that Dino's working on? We, we do. I feel like I, I shouldn't talk about it at this state. We, we have, we have like okay. new commercial efforts underway that, that are uh, under heavy development right now, but it's a little too soon to talk about it publicly. Okay. What about non-commercial or the things that like in the, in the open source side that are exciting to you? Maybe after the 2.0 gets finalized and you're working on what's next. Uh, once 2.0 is stabilized, I think there are a lot of cleanups to do. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I think there, there is still kind of a long list of node compatibility uh, to work on. I think making the LSP faster is is something that that we'll be looking at. I think we removed Dino Bundle uh, for 2.0 uh, because we didn't have a great bundling story. But that bundling is obviously part of of the JavaScript tool chain, mm-hmm. and uh, we think that that's something that Dino ought to provide. It's just you know in in general bundling is is a pretty hard problem to solve. Like it's it's not just simply bundle the script. Like there's there's all sorts of things you need to consider, and there's just tooling that is purpose built for that 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 is much better. Like ES Build, for example. Right. So we are uh, you know potentially uh, not 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 totally decided yet, but but potentially going to undertake uh, having that in in the actual tool chain and providing like a really good experience there. So you are obviously in the code, in the decision-making process. Like you are still rocking your code editor on a daily basis, right? Like you're still writing code? I review a lot of code. I write okay. code sometimes. I write more example code to point out where <laughs> our problems are. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, yeah Dino's, the counts. Dino's like a 27-person company. And even at this scale, like I'm, I'm finding myself becoming more of a manager these days than uh, actual programmer which um, okay. is fine i guess uh, <laughs> i mean are you fighting that off are you embracing it what's your stance on it i mean it's just what problem at, at what scale are you solving a problem are you working on much larger problem because like very often i can just ask in some engineer like can you can you work on this for for three days and, and uh if i work right. on something for three days that is is going to block other things that, that I might be working on. And, and so, yeah, you're just, just working on problems at, at a larger scale. That said, I mean, I, I love programming, obviously it's, it's like deeply satisfying and, and, uh, you know, I just don't understand why people work on crossword puzzles, like work on software. It's, it's, it's the same thing, much, <laughs> but much faster, much, much more fun. Um, yeah. Someday, someday, maybe I, I won't be working on Dino anymore. Uh, and Dino won't be growing anymore or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> then, then uh, you know, I, I, I look forward to uh, sitting down and, and coding on, on some small stuff. But yeah, I, I, right now, the, the scale of Dino is, is such that, that uh, it doesn't make too much sense for me to, to work on uh, coding stuff day in and day out. Sure. Well, you're at least in the weeds of the decision making with the architecture and the direction of the project. So, I mean, it sounds like you are very well versed in where Dino is headed, not just generally speaking as a business or as an open source project, but like in the technical details of the decision making process, whether or not you're actually coding up the functions or not. Yeah. Sure. More or less. Have you ever considered like reorganizing uh, the company a little bit? So maybe get, bring it on a CEO or somebody and then just you know, just stay in IC. Is that something that's attractive to you? Or do you just think that you, you, you need to be at the helm? I've definitely thought about it because I, I mean, I'm not the, you know, I'm, I'm like a nerdy engineer. I'm not necessarily the best salesperson and, uh, you know, doing, doing, uh, the CEO job. I think you, you have to be kind of a salesperson, right? You have to have to go out and, yeah. and close contracts and, and that sort of thing. But I, you know, the focus in my life isn't to be like the best programmer in, in the world. <laughs> like I, I, I'm just sure. trying to build cool stuff 
And I think it's interesting to learn new skills. Like doing Dino as a company has, has been uh, pretty eye-opening because um, before that in my career, I was, you know, an engineer only. And uh, learning, you know, how, how to raise money, how to manage people, how to do sales, how to do product, like all, all of this stuff mm. is, has its own uh, interesting bits. And, you know, I think it's about solving the problem at the end of the day. And you do what it takes to solve the problem. Yeah. Wear whatever hats are necessary. What surprised you in that arena in terms of things you weren't necessarily good at or hadn't done previously? Is the sales process harder than you thought? Is it easier? What's been a surprise in this new role? I think the the need to focus is the thing that I didn't understand very well going, going into this. <laughs> because when, mm. when you have a bunch of people uh, working for you and you have a bunch of money to, to be uh, spent, like you can go in all sorts of directions and like that's all very conceivable. But I think the, there is, there is a real need to kind of focus all of that effort in one direction, like get, get on, add up all those vectors and, and kind of make progress in, in one direction. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a learning experience. <laughs> I'm sure it is in that sense. How do you make those decisions? Like the focus of, no, we're going to, we're not going to go right. We're going to go left and we're all going to like, when it comes down to it, is it intuition? Is it data? Do you ask the people around you? Like, how do you make the call of this is what we're focusing on? Yeah, it's hard to, hard to answer in general, but, uh, yeah. ideally by it with data, right. Ideally we like look at some data and we say, okay, obviously mm -hmm. this is, this is the way to go, right? This, this method is faster than that method. Thus, obviously we do this. Um, or, you know, we, we took a survey and, you know, people prefer this to this. Um, but very, very often, like you don't have clear signals like that, or you just have, you know, some, some dirty signals or some intuition. Yeah, you talk talk to the people you trust. You you take their opinions. Um, I don't, you know, not back in no days nor currently <laughs> do I believe that uh, projects should be run as a democracy. You know, I, I'm I'm a, just took a poll uh, today about something, and uh, uh -huh. uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm I value people's feedback, but um, you know, people's opinions on stuff. But uh, ultimately. You just got to think about it and, <laughs> and weigh in all, of, <laughs> weigh weigh all the evidence yeah, that yeah, you yeah. have, and decide what what is going to level up JavaScript, what is going to further the company, uh, and and try to try to decide that as best you can. Well, on the note of leveling up JavaScript, let's close on this: an open call, a letter to Oracle of all people, if you can consider Oracle. <laughs> person it definitely is not a person <laughs> <laughs> uh, about javascript not the programming language but the word javascript that represents the programming language which really is kind of belongs to the world at this point however the trademark is it the word trademark is the word yes the trademark belongs to oracle and if you go to javascript.tm it says oracle it's time to free JavaScript. So this is an open letter. I think was this penned by you or just signed first by you? Tell us the story here. Was this your idea? This is a great idea. Uh, yeah, this, this is my idea. I actually wrote a previous uh, open letter to, to Oracle. I think two years ago on my personal blog, uh, which obviously did not not get a response. It, you know, when we were talking about <laughs> is Java is is Oracle a, a person or not? It mm -hmm. made me think of a quote from Brian Cantrell, uh, my former boss at, at Joyent, uh, now now CTO of, uh, of Oxide, don't anthropomorphize the lawnmower. The lawnmower is going to just spin, spin its blade and cut, cut grass. Uh, and he was referring to Oracle in, in that, that way. Uh, Oracle, oh, hilarious. Oracle should not be anthropomorphized. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, you know, it might surprise people to know that JavaScript is a trademark. Uh, it came through a partnership that Netscape did with Sun back in the day for uh, this, this newfangled uh, scripting thing in, in, their, in their web browser and they called it JavaScript. Uh, and the partnership mm -hmm. with Sun was somewhat dubious because JavaScript has nothing to do with Java, but they, they ended up calling it, it JavaScript and Sun owned the trademark as a result. And Oracle acquired Sun, I think 2007 or so. Uh, and as a result, Oracle owns the, owns the JavaScript trademark and they 
like dutiful lawyers do, renew it every year. Mm-hmm. Yet uh, Oracle really has no, you know, they do not have a product called JavaScript. Uh, you know, they have several products that use JavaScript, like like everybody does, but they are not a major player in JavaScript development, right? Uh, the major players being kind of Google with, with V8 and Apple with, with JSC, Mozilla, of course, but uh, nevertheless own this this trademark. And, and because of this, uh, the standard for JavaScript, the like spec for JavaScript is called ECMAScript uh, because they have to avoid this name. And, and there is not actually a JavaScript conference. You cannot have a JavaScript conference because Oracle will sue you. You have to have like JSConf. Right. And it just kind of generally creates this confusion where like the world's most popular programming language, right? is somehow using a called a name that like nobody nobody can use and i think it, it is really not reflective of what trademark it's not in the spirit of trademark law uh it's trademark law is i'm perfectly fine i i, <laughs> I have trademarked for for dino but like i do not sure. want people to call things dino but javascript is is just this this vestige of this acquisition and this weird partnership back in the day and oracle you know, you're, if whoever renews it at Oracle, some, some lawyer somewhere just does this because that's what they do with all of their, their trademarks. And what I'm trying to do with this open lander is uh, create some public pressure, create a public, you know, let, let people know how, how annoying this is in, in the community. And gosh, I, you know, my, my letter two years ago just was like, Oracle, you could get some goodwill here by just releasing mm-hmm. this, this trademark to, into the, the, the public domain. Obviously, they, they have not done that. And uh, recently, I've, I've discovered that, that there's actually a, a process at the patent office, the USPTO, to challenge trademarks and that, that the U.S. Uh, PTO is, is actually tra- cracking down on uh, uh, trademark non-use. And there is a legal definition of what it means to abandon a trademark. And this letter explains why Oracle exactly has <laughs> meets this, like they have abandoned the JavaScript trademark as defined in, U- in the U.S. code. And so I am gathering support for challenging this trademark officially uh, with with the U.S. Patent Office. Very nice. Well, this is very well written. You go through it and you describe specifically how they have abandoned this trademark through non-use. And the call to action at the bottom says, if you agree with us, you are encouraged to sign this open letter below. Your support will help raise awareness and add weight to this cause. As of the time of us recording, 9,924, it was three, but I signed it just before we hopped on the call. Very easy, just with your GitHub profile to sign that sucker, uh, have lended their name to this open letter, including folks like uh, Brendan Eich, creator of JavaScript, Rich Harris, creator of Svelte, Isaac Schluter, creator of NPM, Faras DJ, CEO of Socket, some big names, of course, you're, you're, you're on at the top there. So people who are very invested in JavaScript have signed this thing. So to our listener, if you are also so inclined to get behind Ryan's open letter, go sign that. And what's the next step after this? You're actually going to start the legal process. Are you raising money? Do you have enough money? Are there, are there pro bono JavaScript lawyers out there that who might represent you? Yeah, we're, we, we are looking for legal help. So if, if anybody listening is an IP lawyer and uh, is, is willing to contribute some time to help us uh, put together this uh, uh, petition to, to cancel the, the JavaScript trademark, uh, that would be very welcome. I, I think the, the email is uh, lawyers at javascript.tm. Yeah, we'll start undertaking this process uh, one, <laughs> once I get Dino two out. Uh, uh, so in, sure. in, in a couple of weeks or he, here, we'll, we'll we'll try to do this. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, this is just generally trying to make the world's default programming language better. Uh, it's not necessarily a product. It's you know, there's nothing nothing for sale here. <laughs> obviously, it's just uh, sure. uh, trying to to rectify the situation. I, I have no intention of renaming the Dino company to the JavaScript company or anything. I just you know don't like this this weird situation where you know I, I can't say that Dino is a JavaScript runtime. Like that's just silly. That is not what trademarks were intended for. 100% Drew. Well, that URL is javascript.tm. We will drop it in the show notes for easy clicking through. 
and lending your name if you feel so inclined. Ryan, thank you so much for sitting down with me, all the hard work you've been doing on this project over the last seven years, probably at least seven more years ahead of you. I mean, it sounds like this you're in it for the long haul. As a web worker and as a web denizen, I appreciate you trying to make JavaScript and the web a better place. Just keep leveling it up and uh, we appreciate you. Thanks so much. That is JS Party for this week. Now, if you are a listener of the changelog or if you're hooked up to the master feed and your podcast app sees everything we produce, you may have noticed that this episode is also this week's changelog interview. That's not a bug. We just figured both audiences might enjoy it. And if you're not a listener of the changelog, but you'd like to hear more of me talking to interesting people, maybe give that podcast a try you'd probably get a lot out of it. I know I do. Oh, and this is it, the last week in September, which means it's your last chance to get some sweet, sweet changelog stickers for $0. All it costs you is one thoughtful five-star review or blog post. We do accept blog posts. Just send proof of your review to stickers at changelog.com alongside your mailing address, and I'll ship you the goods anywhere in the world. This is your last chance for a while, so let's do this. Thanks again to our partners at Fly.io, to our beat freak, the GOAT, Breakmaster Cylinder, to our friends at Sentry, use code changelog, save 100 bucks, and to you for listening. We love that you choose to spend time with us each week. Next up on the pod, I sit down with Tomek Solkowski from the StackBlitz team to talk about Tutorial Kit, a free and open source tool for creating interactive tutorials on the web. Stay tuned right here. We'll have that episode ready for you next week.